Welcome to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. We're back with episode 56 of the Leo Training Podcast, and this week's guest is John Harrison. John Harrison is a strong first level one kettlebell instructor and a licensed massage therapist. John has an incredible story to share with the strength and conditioning and strong first community. At age 30, John was over 300 pounds. Now at age 41, John is down to 200 pounds and a father of four. John shares how the kettlebell the mace, sandbag, and other unconventional training methods helped him reach this goal. Without further ado, we'll roll to episode 56 with John Harrison. John Harrison, welcome to the Leo Training Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on to the show. I'm really looking forward to sitting down and chatting with you this evening. Yeah, thanks a lot, Joe. It's a real honor to be here and be sharing some uh, listening space with a pretty cool audience, it sounds like. So. Yeah, thank you, my friend. Yeah, it's uh, it's gonna be a, a good uh, chat we got going on here. We got some some really good material to uh, to share with the audience. Uh, you've got a really awesome story um, and one that's uh, pretty transformative. Uh, so with that, I will kind of turn the mic over to you and let you uh, prep the audience and, and give them your background and your journey. Okay, very good. Um, well, I guess I'll. Uh start with maybe my, my athletic background. So um, I really wasn't an athletic individual growing up. Um, I wrestled for about a year and a half in high school and uh, didn't receive a whole lot of support um, in that um, from my family. And, you know, we were busy. I grew up on a farm, so there was always stuff to get done. And unfortunately, wrestling wasn't a priority. Um, fell out of that, started running around and acting crazy like a teenager and, and, and partying. And over the years, um, gained a significant amount of weight. And um, by the age of 30, I was 300 pounds. Um, I'm 41 now, and I'm 200 pounds. I stepped on the scale this morning. Um, That's so, awesome, man. Congra- congrats. <laughs> That's outstanding. Thank you. Um, you know, my... my uh, my weight gain wasn't only food related. Um, there were some other uh, demons involved with that as well. I was uh, bouncing, bartending, running wild. So I don't have to go into the gory details. I'm sure the audience can draw their conclusions as to what my wife, lifestyle may have been like back then. And so um, I had a I had a child, and um, that really changed things for me. When my daughter was born, that was a big wake up call. Um, and uh, really redirected my life. Um, I believe she was an answer to prayer, and uh, maybe maybe not mine, um, but someone. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, when my child was born, that really uh, made me change my focus. And um, one of the things that I, I went back to was 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 actually exercising and fitness. Just remembering back to when I was a wrestler in high school, um, and just how that made me felt feel, and you know the the, the rocks that you got from it and everything. I started going back to the gym and really trying to take care of my body. Also trying to get my mind right and, and, and be the father that I needed to be for my child. So that was my first motivator was being responsible for another life. Um, yeah, so um, my weight fluctuated up and down over the years. My daughter was born at um, 20, so I was 26 when she was born. Um, I met my wife. So she's from a previous relationship. I met my wife and I was... 27, my current wife. And um, of course, when I met her, her mom decided to load up the house with all the favorite goodies that she knew that I liked and fattened me up. So I actually went from when I met my wife, I was down to about 230 um, to three back up to 300. And uh, at 30 years old, I was down on the floor with my two year old daughter, busted my pants wide open, size 38 inch jeans, and said, All right, man, I'm done. I'm done. So then, yeah, I started back on the conventional training, um, you know, elliptical machines, treadmills, jogging, 
you know, reading Flex and Bodybuilder magazines, trying to get ideas, Men's Health magazine, and um, just kind of following the conventional wisdom that was out there and had pretty good success. I, got, I dropped about 60 pounds um, utilizing those methods. Um, but still, at 240 pounds and 5 foot 10, uh, my body fat percentage was close to 30 percent. And it wasn't a healthy place to be, but I was stuck. And so um, after just kind of running into walls time after time, I just did like a Google search one day for unconventional methods, unconventional exercise methods. I was just kind of like at my wit's end and was opened up to like this world of kettlebells and sandbags and guys making homemade equipment in their backyard and pulling sleds. And like um, Zach Evanesh from the Underground Strength Gym down in Jersey, Travis Stutzel. Some of the guys early back in the day, the early um, garage gym guys on YouTube, you know, really were huge inspirations to me. So I started doing all this stuff in my backyard, went out and picked up a kettlebell. Now, at the time, I was pretty strong, good for pressing about a 70 pound dumbbell. So I went out and picked up a 65 pound kettlebell, thinking that would be a good place to start. And boy, I was humbled. <laughs> <laughs> I was humbled. Um, within a week, I ended up at the chiropractor. Um, of course, I was just trying to emulate what I had seen other people doing on YouTube with the kettlebells with no proper coaching. Uh, so I ended up at the chiropractor, tweaked my back pretty bad, trying to do a side bent press. And um, that motivated me to seek out some professional training. I knew I was on to something with the kettlebells, though, just by um, in that short amount of time. The difficulty of the movements, the difficulty of the exercises, it just made me made me want to chase it even more. Sure. Um, so the, the local gentleman um, here in North Wales, Pennsylvania, about it's a suburb of Philadelphia by the name of Andre Patenko, um, who's with the RKC and uh, it's a hand to hand KGB combat instructor, Sistema instructor, you know, pretty hardcore dude. And uh, I went down and trained with Andre for about 10 weeks and uh, he prepared me for my HKC. Nice. So that was that was in 2004. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Wow. Um, no, no, no. That was in 2009. I went for my HKC, and uh, <clears throat> the HKC was great. Rick gave me a base understanding of kettlebells, Turkish get up, goblet squat, and really how to get very efficient and um, just understand the basic movements, the kettlebell, you know, and spent a lot of time just practicing and mastering those movements. And then, of course, I started teaching um, out of my little studio here. Um, and so that pushed me into the FMS. Um, I started, of course, through the RKC um, and the HKC. Um, received a lot of information periodically from FMS and uh, Phil Sclerito, who is a, a master SFG and puts on a lot of stuff here in Pennsylvania, um, had hosted a FMS workshop in Plymouth meeting uh, with Brett Jones. And so I went awesome. down and yeah, spent three days with uh, Brett Jones and, and Phil Sclerito and just had an awesome time. And, and for me, that was, I think, what had, um, that was like the tipping point for me to say, okay, this is something that I want to pursue full time. Uh, as a career and try to make a living out of helping people move better and feel better. Um, the FMS was a big eye opener for me, just in understanding movement and analyzing movement and how to fix movement. And not that we've got all the answers, um, but man, what a great, great uh, resource that became for me. And now the FMS then pushed me into massage therapy. Uh, so it was kind of a natural progression, you know, once I started analyzing movement and realized these people have movement restrictions, most of them were soft tissue related. Instead of referring them out to a local body work practitioner, I'm like, why can't I just keep the business in house sure. and go and license that a massage therapist myself? So I spent 18 months training at the Pennsylvania Institute of Massage Therapy, uh, became a state licensed massage therapist in 2011 and have been practicing part time. Um, I do travel on the road. Um, I, that's the bulk of what I do is I'll go see people at home, um, massage training and, you know, whatever, uh, whatever suits their needs. Um, so some clients I'm just seeing for massage therapy and body work, 
Some are utilizing all my services, kettlebell, sandbags, and the mace is new. We didn't even touch on the mace, but nice. Um, yeah. Um, so that's kind of my my progression. And uh, so, so what were? Could you just touch on what you were doing professionally before you started? You know, doing yeah. uh, massage therapy and training full time. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me about that. Um, so, uh, up until about two years ago, uh, I worked, um, eight years at the local healthcare industry here in at Allentown, Pennsylvania, as a respiratory therapy technician and orthotic fitter. So I did uh, primarily pre and post op racing and then, um, home care, respiratory. So that was vents, trach, CPAP, BiPAP, all that fun stuff. Um, and it was it was a tough transition, but you know, with all the changes that have occurred within the healthcare industry over the last five years, uh, it made it a pretty easy decision for me, really, because for the middle level employees like myself, things weren't too good. And um, so, yeah, it made it a pretty easy easy decision for me to say, you know what, it's time to, to pursue this full time. And so it's been a scary two years but it's been a very rewarding and fulfilling two years and a very learning two years you know i've learned a lot about myself and um it just seems like within the last year i've really picked up a lot of traction which is good made a lot of great connections and i'm really excited to see what 41 is going to bring for me here i just turned 41 last week and um i'm blessed to be where i'm at awesome man yeah, just that's a that's a incredible journey. So, some specific questions um, that you and I chatted about, kind of uh, off camera before we got rolling here. So, um, when you when you were transitioning, going from from conventional you know training methods, um, you know utilizing cardiovascular, elliptical, treadmill, um, you know that type of thing, and then gravitating towards and finding things like sandbags and the kettlebell. Um, what, okay. First question is what, was there any particular, uh, exercise or lift or skill that you found particularly useful at the beginning? Um, and then later on found more useful. Um, and then did you have to make any changes biomechanically, um, when you were at a heavier weight to adjust the technique? Mm. Hmm. Yeah, um, I think a lot of it certainly has been, it's been an interesting evolution. Um, but I would say the biggest, um, the exercise that impressed me or lift that impressed me the most was the Turkish get up. Um, I remember a guy telling me in a break room at, at the hospital that I was working at one day, him and his friends were trying to get in shape for um, Halloween. They were doing, a, they were dressing up as the guys from 300. Nice. And so he, He's like, you remember the 300 workouts back in the day? Yeah. You know, like, yeah. So he was like, you got to check it out, man. 300 workouts are awesome. And he's like, there's this one movement in there. It's called the Turkish get up. And he's like, I'm telling you, man, if you try it, you're going to be very humble. He's like, start out light. He's like, he's like, I didn't recommend trying with no weight. So the first time I tried a Turkish get up, um, mind you, I was good for deadlifting about 400 pounds. Not a huge number by a lot of people's standards, but I was a pretty strong dude. I couldn't get off the floor with a 15 pound dumbbell over my head. So, um, yeah, uh, the Turkish get up for me, I think was the most educational lift, okay. um, because it taught me a lot about myself and how to move and how to move within a certain amount of space. <clears throat> yeah. Um, the kettlebell swing then I would say was probably second to that because, I felt it had a lot of carryover. I'm a big outdoorsman. I love hiking, backpacking, and um, you know, 20 mile, 30 mile treks. And um, the year after I started implementing kettlebell training into my my programming, my trekking that year was easier than any previous year. Awesome, that's excellent. So now. But also think about the first year I started training. So within a year of training with kettlebells and unconventional methods, I went from 230 pounds to 210 pounds. So I lost, you know, 20 pounds in the first year. And 
that was huge for me, you know, especially as a hiker, backpacker, you already got, you know, 30, 40, 50 pounds on your back. So carrying an extra 30 pounds of body weight around, uh, it wasn't real advantageous to sure. longevity on the trip. And yeah, so um, I don't know that I necessarily had to, to, to modify any lifts to, to compensate for body mass. Um, but as my body mass decreased, my list became more efficient. Okay. Okay. You know, so yeah, I think that's probably, you know, what, what I would say about that. Um, I can see when I look back at even some old training videos of myself, um, how the added body mass just changed the dynamic of the lift. Right. Absolutely. You know? and Absolutely. Fortunately, I think I had a good amount of structural integrity there already from you know previous weight and strength training that I had done to where it wasn't dangerous for me where I don't know if maybe somebody that didn't have that structural integrity there would have the same success right right you know? now um would you make any recommendations like uh or or insight like if if somebody is heavier and overweight um like you know, tr like if they're going from the deadlift to the swing, right? Um, even just the, the hike phase can be a little bit difficult uh, for some people due to due to body mass. Um, you know, is there anything that you may recommend for them to like, you know, adjust the technique? Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, the towel method always seems to just lend itself to, you yeah. know, a little more, um, a little more room you know, creating a little bit more space and, um, and then just practicing the hinge, you know, so practicing the hinge, you know, the FMS teaches, um, the hinge using the dowel, you know, maintaining those three points of contact, um, practicing that movement pattern is really what I reinforce with, you know, clients that might have that, because I think the more that we can reinforce that the more natural it's going to come to them when, when they go to pick, pick up the kettlebell and, and do swings. Awesome. That's awesome. So that's kind of my go-to, like, you know, um, methodology for, for teaching. Excellent. Now, um, you've also recently, uh, or before we transition, is there anything else that you want to touch on, uh, like key, key points or any takeaways you think may be important um, if somebody is interested in learning kettlebells um, and is, is overweight? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think seeking out an FMS first would be advantageous or a lot of these guys now have dual certifications, right? So some, finding somebody that understands movement first is really important. Um, as I age, I understand the value of that more and more. And, <clears throat> um, of course, within the strong first and hard style community, um, most of these guys are, are movement nuts as well. Yeah. So, you know, seeking out a qualified coach, absolutely, you know, Jillian Michaels and Bob Harper, I, I don't know, maybe we should call out people here, but there's just a lot of stuff out there that's not good, you know, so seeking out qualified Russian kettlebell trainers, um, people that have been certified through the Strong First, RKC, you know, I mean, I got love for everybody out there. So, you know, I'm, I'm going into the GS. I was expecting maybe to get a little bit of flack from the hard style community, but I haven't. I've got nothing but love and support, and uh, that's been really cool as well. Awesome, awesome. Well, so that that that's exactly where I was kind of headed. So, um, sorry, my cat just decided to to run by me and spooked me because I have headphones on right now. So, you know, it's uh, just staying on your toes around here. <laughs> um, but. Uh, yeah, so let's let's talk about that a little bit. Um, kind of what 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 prompted you to, you know, uh, dip your toe into that pool, so to speak, and then um, what you're, I guess, uh, gonna do for the first competition, uh, what lift, and um, you know how you've been training, how it's different from from hard style methods, um, what's carryover, you know, what are what are what things have uh, helped out, what have you had to modify in terms of you know breathing or technique, that type of thing. Sure. 
Um, over the last year, uh, I've connected with a lot of great people through Facebook. There's uh, unconventionalathletes.com, um, which has got thousands and thousands of members now. Um, but I met a lot of really good people through that. Rick Brown, Mr. Mace Man, Rick Brown, uh, Valerie Pelaleski, who's uh, my coach, a three-time gold medalist, female champion, 53 years old, and just a machine. Uh, she's awesome. He's right out of Jersey and um, and Kelly Manzone. I would say Kelly Manzone is probably uh, my biggest supporter. She's um, she's just somebody that is very like minded and um, she encouraged me to come out to a mace competition. She's like, you know, you, you know, you've been swinging this mace. We went to the uh, Brick Brown certification last year together, and that's kind of how we linked up. And she's like, you know, you, you got to get up there on the platform. So uh, about a month ago. I went over to Jersey, um, down to Freehold, and they were holding a, a, a vintage strength games there. And I got up on the platform and swung the mace and um, was encouraged then to come swing the mace at Arnold's um, by Yuri Petronov and Valerie. And that, uh, Kelly said, John, um, you're not going to go all the way to Arnold's and just swing the mace. She's like, if you're going to go to the Arnold's, you got to compete in GS. Nice. And so I went home, thought about it, talked to my wife, and she gave me 100% support and um, decided to reach out then to my now current coach and um, inquire about training. So I'm really fortunate to have a coach um, as qualified and as decorated as Valerie within a, an hour's drive from me. And um, I, I think it's pretty cool how it all worked out. Uh, yeah, so the, um, the, the I would say being rooted in, in hard style, um, there's definitely a lot of, I think, advantages. Um, it, uh, one being just the, talking about structural integrity earlier. Um, I feel like my, um, you know, the attention to the hip drive that the hard style teaches has just, made the transition into the snatch, which is my lift that I'll be competing in um, very smooth. Uh, when I went down and saw my coach for the first time, not to say that I went down there and nailed it, um, but it was a very good first session. And so having that, um, that background in, 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 in hard style um, really just made me feel comfortable. Um, the breathing though, the anatomical versus biomechanical breathing was a huge adjustment for me and sure. still is. Sure. You know, I find, you know, four, five, six minutes in to my, you know, I haven't even done a 10 minute set yet, but I'm working up to that point. Um, you know, it's, it's at that four or five minute mark where I actually start to revert back to the biomechanical breathing where the anatomical breathing, right, is supposed to give you more oxygen. That's the whole idea of. You know, inhaling as you open, exhaling as you go down. Right. Um, so it's, I'm still learning, you know, I'm still learning with that, but I do see uh, my work capacity increasing, which is good. And of course, when you snatch a lot, you tend to get lean. Um, so I've actually been getting a little leaner over the last few weeks, which isn't bad either because there maybe it was a couple of extra pounds still hanging on from the holidays. So nice. That's awesome. Very yeah. Good. Yeah. Very cool. Yep. Um, so I, I've never really done a ton with with mace training. So what are like you know what are some of the benefits of you know swinging the mace um, you know compared to the kettlebell? Because I mean you know it's different. This 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 uh, implement this tool is it's going behind your back. So you again you have to kind of well I'll let you describe it. What you have to do to make sure you're kind of staying on both feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, I think. You know, first, having um, good flexibility in the wrist, tricep, and mobility in the thoracic area is important before um, swinging a mace. So having proper warm-up is important right before any type of training, especially as you get older. Um, but that being said, the mace in and of itself can provide a lot of that. So I find that with a little bit of warm-up, I can be really tight, and I can come out here and swing my 25-pound mace for five or six minutes and then I feel fantastic. Um, so 
because of emotion. Um, when you learn how to use the mace the right way, it's a real simple technique. Um, spending a day with Rick Brown cleaned me up. And, um, and once I learned that technique from Rick, um, I really feel like it just took my, my training with the mace to another level. But that has direct carryover in a kettlebell training. Because you're swinging around a 30-pound mace at the end of a, you know, 54-inch steel stick, you're going to develop a tremendous amount of upper body muscular endurance. Right, 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 right. And, resil and resiliency. So um, I feel that it's done wonders for my shoulder health, my shoulder mobility, and rotational strength and power. Um, you know, for anybody that's a, a martial arts practitioner, grappler, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, mace training should be part of their arsenal, I believe. Cool. And that's not even my thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and plus, man, it just feels cool swinging this big steel club around. You know, you can't help but feel like a gladiator. <laughs> yeah. You know? so, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Is there, yeah. um, you got any recommendations for resources if people are interested in learning more about um, the mace and training with the mace? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Rick Brown, okay. uh, Mr. Mace, Rick Brown. Um, you can just do a Google search for Rick Brown, Mr. Mace Man, and he'll come up. Um, he's the, um, the gentleman that I sought after for training. And um, 8xclubs.com, uh, Don Giordano. Um, they're the Vintage Strength. They're the official mace of the Vintage Strength Games. And Don has some really good resources on his website about mace training. Okay, cool. Absolutely. I'll yeah. make sure I include them in the show notes and – be sure to check them out myself. Awesome. Awesome, awesome man. Um, cool. Anything else you want to touch on regarding the mace and, and or GS? Um, yeah, you know, actually, um, we go back to, to Geary Sport a little bit. I, I know we had talked about this when we talked on the phone um, last month, and, and it was something that I wanted to talk about um, that was very attractive to me about um, the sport community. Um their their focus on the community. Um, and when I walked through the doors there, they had people from all walks of life up there on the platform competing. Um, they weren't all what maybe a lot of the public would perceive as athletes. Mm -hmm. And to me, that just tugged on my heartstrings because, um, well, first of all, knowing what the kettlebell has done for me and my health, um, of getting young, giving maybe young men um, that are a little misguided some direction, um, utilizing our gifts and our passions to help the community um, is really, really important. It's important to me. It's always been important to me. And when I saw that kind of almost at the center to me, that's the vision that I got when I walked in and saw what was going on there. Right. So. I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Um, what I see is a lot of love. Yeah, it's a business for sure. You know, it's a competition, whatever. But there was a lot of love and a great, strong sense of community, camaraderie, and sportsmanship. It was just something I'd never experienced before. So it's pretty, pretty cool to be a part of it. Look forward to, to growing, hopefully growing with it. Awesome. Yeah, that's outstanding to hear. That's That's a really... I think integral, integral piece of, um, you know, any community or team for it to be successful is that, uh, chemistry and that camaraderie. And that's yeah. really, that's really what helps things grow, to be honest. Um, yeah. you know, that's what, that's what makes a big, big difference. Uh, and that's what keeps, you know, not only growing, but people, the same people coming back, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's that environment you create and that's, that's what makes things special. That's, um, you know, my opinion, I think that's one of the special things about strong first is that is not only the principles, but the people, um, yeah. I think the, the people are phenomenal and, and, uh, the same can be said for, for some of the people that you've uh, mentioned and connected with. And so that's, that's one of the, the best part or best elements of, of doing this kind of thing is, is connecting with people and, getting the message out there and sharing it. So that's awesome. That's really cool. To hear. That's right. And I think especially since unconventional training is still really, I think in its infancy, you know, 
I think CrossFit's done a great job of exposing people to it. Um, you know, but I think the conventional training, like like you you and I understand it, and maybe the hard style community understands it, I think is a little different. And it's exciting to be at what I feel on the on the edge of a tipping point. And I think it's about to spill over into the community yet on a large scale. And I plan on bringing it to, to where I'm at in this community here. So very cool, excellent. Yeah. Um, and then, so uh, let, we'll transition to a different different topic, but um, you know, with your massage therapy skills, why don't you talk a little bit about how that you uh, take that knowledge and that skill set and integrate that into a, a training session for for your clients? That's that's pretty uh, unique from what you were telling me. Yeah, yeah. Um, really, the um, you know the FMS has become my go-to um, screening tool for any new client, whether they come to me for training, massage, or both, uh, because it really gives a good indicator as to the person's movement, ability, and capacity. Um, and then understanding now, as a massage therapist, fascial lines, fascial restrictions, and you know, incorporating the FMS and understanding then the movement and how the body's supposed to look in movement, um, I feel just gives me a, a greater sense of, of what to look for when I have somebody crawling on the floor in my studio. Um, and then having the ability to stop the person and say, you know what, it looks like you've got something going on in your adductors, you've got this major restriction, your knee keeps pulling in, or, you know, you've got... Um, some restriction in your ankle, your ankles are locked up, you know, before FMS, before massage therapy, I don't know that I would have realized that, right. you know, so, um, and then being able to stop and fix it, being able to stop and then put them on my table and say, here, let's work that out. Let's fix that. And, and generally get some restored movement. Um, you know, I like, I like to fix, I like, you know, I'm a fixer. And so <laughs> I think it's just kind of part of my, my nature, I don't know if it's a, a guy thing or, or, or what, but being able to um, restore movement is very rewarding, you know, and, and then being able to reinforce and strengthen what you've restored by using cool tools like kettlebells, sandbags, and, and mace spells is, is even more rewarding. Um, being able to teach people, you know, I'm, I'm an educator, and my, my main goal is to teach people how to do this in their basement. Do this in your Backyard, fortunate studio attached to my house that I can make a little bit of a living doing it. Um, yeah, that's so cool. yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, that last little part there, you were talking about uh, educator, and then the uh, connection kind of skipped out a little bit. So if you could just sorry to re repeat that, so we don't miss it. Sure. Um, yeah, I like to. Um, I really like to educate people and. And, and on them as, as, as much information as they can so they can do this on their own, in their home. So I try to give people as much information as they can about movement, how to restore movement themselves, whether it's using lacrosse balls, foam rollers, self-massage tools, right? Uh, there's some great FMS drills that you can teach people, corrective exercises, crocodile breath, you know, diaphragmatic breathing. Um, and so I generally try to get people out of here while I'm trying to make money and, and I want to stay in business at the same time, I'm trying to restore people and bring them to a point where they don't have to rely on me. They don't have to rely on a gym. They don't have to rely on a personal trainer. They walk out to their living room in the morning and they got their kettlebell sitting there and, and they know what to do. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. They're self-sufficient for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Excellent. Um, is there anything else that you want to touch on before we move into rapid fire? Um, no, I think that, uh, got about covered it. Awesome. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So these are, uh, I always enjoy asking everybody. These, these are a lot of fun. Um, so John, given your current knowledge level and all of your experience, uh, what advice would you give yourself if you could go back in time, uh, 15 years ago? Wow. Um, I would say the first thing 
I would tell myself is to get off the machines and um, do more body weight. Awesome. Um, yeah, that's the first thing I would tell myself. Cool. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite strength training exercise if you had to pick one? <sighs> I know that's a tough one. That is, but you know, I think I would have to say the Turkish get up. Yeah, that's right. That's my favorite too. Uh, how has your training changed today compared to 15 years ago? Uh, it's a lot more efficient, um, and it has a lot more practical carryover into many other areas of my life. It's no longer about vanity, you know. While looking good is certainly part of it, it's really become more about feeling well and then functioning well as a human and being as strong as I can for my family. Right. Health. Yes, that's right. right. Awesome. Very, very good. Um, what injury have you had, and how did it affect your training? Uh, well, previous to kettlebell training, um, I developed a nasty bone spur on the tip of my acromion on my left side, um, which really created a lot of uh, dysfunction for me. Mm -hmm. uh, since kettlebell training, other than my initial tweaking of my back that I mentioned earlier, um, I've not had an injury. Good for there you. you go. That's good. <laughs> That's really good. Uh, I, I did have a bit of fascial restriction at one time. Yeah. Whether that was related to kettlebells or not, I don't know. Right. But nothing, nothing serious. Good. Good to hear. Yeah. Uh, what is one thing that junior athletes, high school, high school age athletes should be doing to complement their training and their health? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you see a lot of these, these guys going to burn out and max out. And I understand that as a young man, you know, you get that ego and that testosterone going when you're in the gym with your buddies. Um, and not to say that there's not times when we shouldn't push ourselves to that point. But I see a lot of guys pushing themselves to that point too often. And, um, of course, being an orthopedic fitter and bracer, doing pre- and post-op ACL and MCL surgeries, a lot of what I saw were, were young athletes. So it's very obvious and evident to me that there's a lot of overtraining going on. Mm -hmm. um, I think integrating more mobility, um, kettlebell swings, and Turkish get-ups would pay any athlete huge dividends if they took it seriously. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, it's amazing how many high school athletes I see and in general, pretty much everyone just does not have the ability or lacks the awareness to move through their hips. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I'm not saying like I'm picking on this people cause I, I was that person too, you know, absolutely five, yeah. six years ago, but, but you're yeah. more aware of it when you have the ability to do it and, and looking back. And so you, you can see it so much more clearly now. Yeah. 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 It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, what's your best tip to improve recovery? Sleep and hydration. Awesome. Sleep and hydration. That's right, baby. Love those Z's. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite meal? Oh, uh, curry. I'm a coconut curry guy. I love, yeah. love my Indian food and that Thai in Thai food. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big curry fan. That's probably my go-to. Excellent. You um, might not want to be training with me the next day after that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, man. I like spicy food too. Curry's good. Um, <laughs> what's one book everyone should read? Hmm. Boy, I would say probably for me, the biggest influence for um, my own training was Athletic Body and Balance. Oh, by Cook. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, okay. Who, final question, who have you studied or do you continue to study uh, to uh, improve in your career? Hmm. A 
You know, that's a tough question because there's a lot of people. Oh, it doesn't have to be that, one. It could be multiple. Yeah, there's a lot of people that I look up to and admire. Um, of course, you can help but admire Pavel Satsuline right. and what he's done in the U.S. in spreading of the kettlebell love um, and educating. Uh, so absolutely, Pavel, I'm a student of him and will be till the day I can no longer swing kettlebell. Hmm. Um, I think um, there's uh, uh, a big, um, his name is Pavel Waduto from the Art of Functional Movement System out of Norway. Okay. And he's been a huge inspiration to me over the last year in understanding and integrating more mobility flows and movement patterns, um, helping me understand how to string movements together. You know, the hard style method can be very rigid, um, which is good because it does build a good amount of structural integrity. But for me, and probably just my mechanics and the way my body functions, flowing didn't come natural. Sure. Um, so so um, looking at the guys that are doing some more of this the flow stuff um, and Paul, I just love Paul and what he does. Check him out. You'll love it. He's, uh, he's a great guy over there in Norway. Cool. They, they, they do also implement kettlebell. They're more of a sport lifting um, club, but they do mace work and a ton of other really cool unconventional training. Excellent. Excellent. I'll make sure I include uh, a link in the show notes. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, well uh, John, it's been great chatting with you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, great chat. You too. Yeah, yeah thanks yeah. so much for, for doing this. So just hang on the line. Let me give you a proper goodbye uh, offline. All right. Very good. Thanks for tuning in and listening to this brand new episode of the Leo Training Podcast. If you enjoyed the content, head on over to iTunes and drop in a five-star review. Or, even better, share it on your favorite social media networks such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. And be sure to tune in next week when I have another brand new episode and I sit down with Dr. Anders Ericsson and Dr. Robert Poole and we discuss their book, Peak, The Science of High Performance Expertise. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.